Hello, and welcome to Creating Linus Online School of Jewelry. I'm Nicole Baxter, founder and head teacher. You'll get an email each week letting you know your class is ready to go. Simply go to your library. This is where you'll find all of your past classes and newest one. So you can always watch and re-watch tutorials whenever you like. Every video tutorial will also come with a downloadable written tutorial, your textbooks. Feel free to print them, view them on any device as a PDF document, or better yet, view them online. No need to take up space on your device. You'll find what you're looking for nice and fast in your fully searchable library. Got questions? Ask them in our project forums. I love questions, and if I've missed something in a tutorial, or if you're having a hard time making something work, please let us know. The real joy of an online school is we can go back to any tutorial and add amendments. This way, we can always be refining and improving your classes. Creating Linus will offer a two-year intensive online learning experience centered around a curriculum designed to guide students from beginner to advanced jewelry maker. As a way of raising funds to produce year one, I've launched a Kickstarter project. If you become a backer and support my Kickstarter project, not only will you learn how to make jewelry, you'll be helping me build Creating Linus Online School of Jewelry. To find out how to become a backer and register for your first year of classes, follow the link to my Kickstarter page. Our first project, the basic flower earring, is, well, very basic. I chose to start with this project because I wanted to illustrate just how effective simple jewelry design can be. Even a beginner can design and execute original, beautifully well-made jewelry with very few tools and a small materials budget. Project 1, the basic flower earring, will be taught in four parts. Part 1, sawing out the flower. Part 2, introduction to the ammonia patina. Part 3, the ear wire and the assignment. Lastly, part 4, the support tutorials. I have produced the first project, the basic flower earring, as an example of the program to give potential students an idea of how it will work and the quality of the teaching. As a way of raising the funds to produce the first year of classes, I have launched a Kickstarter project. But I'll talk more about that later. Let's get started. The basic flower earring is composed of two parts, a sterling silver ear wire and a copper flower which has been finished with an ammonia patina. In this tutorial, you'll learn how to saw out and emery the copper flower. As this is a project tutorial, I will not stop to explain tools or techniques, although I may offer a few pointers, tips, and tricks. To learn more about tools or techniques used in this project tutorial, please view Part 4, the Support Tutorials. We will need two identical copper flowers. Start with a glued billet of two pieces of 20 gauge copper sheet. How big should the pieces of copper be? Well, that depends. I could choose to be conservative with my materials and use a 25 by 25 millimeter piece, but that would leave me very little to hold on to while cutting. Since I'm working with copper, I'm going to be a little bit wasteful and work with a much bigger piece than I need, 45 by 45 millimeters. Plus, this way my fingers won't be in the way of your view. But you'll need to decide for yourself. I would recommend going with a bigger piece to start with and working your way towards smaller ones once you have some experience. Center punch and drill a 1.5 millimeter hole in the center of the flower. Be sure to deburr the back side. This will allow for free movement on the V-board. Burrs are rough and like to snag on the board, making it more difficult to cut a smooth line. Don't forget a little wax on the blade. This will lubricate the blade and make for an easier and smoother cut. 
This flower takes me about nine minutes to saw out. As a beginner, it will take you longer. Move through the metal at a nice, slow, steady pace. The goal here is accuracy, not speed. If you choose to make more than one pair of earrings, and I do recommend you do, your sawing skills will improve with repetition. Right now, your sawing skills are in training. The more you saw, the better your sawing skills will become. Pivots are one of the hardest cuts to master. This project will give you lots of practice. But first, separate your flower billet so you can emery one flower at a time. Using a pivot to cut a point will never end in a point. This is because a pivot is a tiny circle. As wonky as this flower looks, it is fixable with emery. I would recommend using a bit of emery with your jeweler's saw and an emery pad, both at 220 grit. A little bit of patience and a little bit of elbow grease will get the job done quite nicely. Much better. I love emmering. As long as you saw on the correct side of the line, emmering can make any bad cut look good. Alternatively, you could. Chunking out your flower will give it nice crisp points. This time, I'm going to use only one layer of copper, as it's much easier. If you find you have difficulty sawing out your flower as a billet, no, 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 no! Uh. You might want to try sawing a single layer of copper. This might work better for you. Remember, as long as you're on the correct side of the cut line, files and emery can fix any bad cut. Before you start cutting, you'll need to draw some lines to follow. Remember, slow and steady wins the race. The better you're sawing now, the less emmering there will be later. Don't forget, use the V-board to stabilize your sawing. You don't want to end up nicking or cross-cutting. Next, chunk it out. Again, don't forget to use the V-board to stabilize your sawing. It's really easy to cross-cut. I'm cutting right into the V-board as well as the copper. This will slow down the cut and minimize your chance of overcutting. You'll still have to do some emmering, but you should be able to achieve some nice, tight points. But this time, I'm going to use a loose piece of emery with no tape on the backside. Why? The tape reinforces the emery so it won't shred as quickly, but it makes it thicker which can make it difficult to get in an emery-type points and an emery pad. As you can see, the points are a little bit tighter when chunking as compared to pivoting. Now that your flower is sawn out and emeried, it's time to add the patina. While preparing for this lecture, it occurred to me, although I had some basic knowledge of the ammonia patina, it was in truth limited to what I had learnt in school. I thought it was time I got full-on mad scientist and learned what ammonia could do. I spent six months and created 300 samples getting to know ammonia. I was amazed at the surprising range of color and texture I could achieve. Here are a few examples of my samples. What follows are excerpts from my ammonia patina journal, my failures, my successes, and my methodology. Copper takes a patina especially well. Every metal has its own personality. I like to think of copper as an old, smelly, dirty, drunk, homeless man. And if you've ever worked with it, you'll understand why. Because copper is such a dirty, dirty metal, it likes to oxidize. In simple terms, put copper next to a chemical and it will react by changing colors. This process is called patination. The first patina recipe I was introduced to in school uses household ammonia, water, and table salt. This was the starting point for my study. Not much to go on, so I researched existing literature. I quickly found there wasn't a lot of information out there. 
although some excellent people have offered up some informative YouTube videos. They really only cover a couple of variations, using salt, ammonia, and vinegar. Some involve potato chips, and some mustard. Most intriguing. I spent some time in serious contemplation. If mustard and potato chips could be used with ammonia to form patinas, what other things could be used? I decided anything could be used and set about testing everything. But first, I took a step backwards as I felt I should get to know ammonia all by itself to discover what ammonia brought to the patina before introducing it to organic material or other chemicals. What I wanted to know, what does ammonia bring to the patina? Household ammonia can be clear or yellow, depending on the manufacturer. I have not noticed a difference and have no preference between the two. Fume chamber. You'll need a plastic container with a lid. Poke a hole through the container or drill a hole, which will snugly fit your wire. Repeat on the other side and slide your wire through. What gauge of wire? What did you use to poke the hole with? And what size of hole? Does wire have to be copper? Does the container have to be clear? Any container with a lid will do, but a clear container does make it easier to see the progression of the patina without having to open the lid and peek in. I'm using 18 gauge copper wire to suspend my object, but any wire will do, steel, brass, or even silver. In fact, it does not even need to be wire. It could be string or thread, fishing line, or dental floss. Basically anything which can hold your object in place, but not affect the patina. Experiment and see what works for you. There are many ways to make a hole. I'm using an old finishing nail I found in the garage. Anything pointy and the right size will do. The hole should be just a little bit bigger than the wire you're using. If your object has a hole, threading it through a wire works nicely, but if you have multiple objects with holes, a curvy bit of wire will enable each piece to remain separate and not get stuck together. Two wires might be required for objects with no holes from which to hang them. Depending on the object you wish to patina, you will have to get clever and customize the hanging mechanisms. Put a bit of paper towel at the bottom of the fume chamber. I used three teaspoons of ammonia for the paper towel fume chamber and one cup of ammonia for the bath fume chamber. I used this recipe as a constant as I decided not to play with different amounts of ammonia at this time, maybe later. You'll also need to do some prep work. It is essential the copper be free of oxides, grease, and dirt. Otherwise, the patina will not work. Well, it'll work. You'll get something, but it may not bond to the metal and will be very fragile. I will go into great detail about how to clean your copper as well as how to seal and deal with your patina in part 2i, preparations and sealing and dealing. Let's get started. But first, inhaling ammonia fumes can be harmful. Don't do it. Always work in a well-ventilated room. Open up some windows if you can. Since ammonia is an irritant, protect your hands, wear gloves, and it can't hurt to wear protective eyewear in case of splashing. And always be sure to read the manufacturer's warning label. I explored the fume chamber using both the paper towel and the ammonia bath. I wanted to see if there was any difference between using paper towel or a bath as an ammonia delivery method. Then I let them cook. Cook? Cook. I like to call the patina process or the chemical reaction cooking. How do you know when it's done cooking? Depending on a number of factors, cook times being one of them, I found a single patina recipe could yield a range of effects. So when it comes to knowing when the patina is finished cooking, it really depends on the effect you're looking for. This is when research and sample making become invaluable. I'd never done this before and I wasn't sure what to expect, but a dark olive brown began to form. After five hours, I pulled the copper out of the fume chambers and let them dry for 24 hours. The result, a somewhat disappointing dusty olive brown, but very encouraging. 
I cooked up a few more samples from 5 hours to 480 hours, or 20 days. After 5 hours, there's not much of a difference between the paper towel fume chamber and the bath fume chamber. At 6 hours, the disappointing dusty olive brown is turning into a lovely fog of blues, greens, and olive brown. Add yet one more hour and our lovely fog of blues and greens have disappeared. Replaced with a muddy wash of blue-green, we jump ahead from 7 hours to 16 hours and the landscape has changed remarkably, now resembling an acid-washed universe full of heavenly bodies. Or at least that's what I see. I also see a flying dog. At 29 hours, the heavenly bodies have retreated, replaced by a gloomy, moody, dark green, with the exception of side B on the paper towel fume chamber sample, which is a bit brighter with flashes of blue. After 46 hours, we finally see a marked difference between the two fume chamber methods, the paper towel method staying with shades of greens and the bath method moving into shades of blues. And we're back to a very spacey, abstract landscape. At 73 hours, a change in color and textures, most notable, side A of the bath fume chamber has developed a dark blue crust of scale-like shards, while side A of the paper towel fume chamber has also developed blue scales, but much smaller and fewer. 96 hours and gone are the scales. Again, we see a marked difference in the colors. The paper towel fume chamber with bright green and bits of indigo blue, and the bath fume chamber dominated by various shades of blue, take a big jump in cooking time to 240 hours and a new color appears, a brilliant lemon olive green, a very dramatic patina as it first formed a crunchy dark blue shell, something very new and I wasn't entirely sure what to do with it. I could simply let it dry or I thought I could explore and have a peek under the shell. After much thought, I decided to give it a wash in warm water. Unfortunately, or depending on how you look at it, fortunately, the crust was not stable and rinsed off easily. But underneath lay this wonderful green. I was very taken with that brilliant lemon olive green and decided to stop and play for a bit. So I cooked up some more samples. Some I cooked for 10 days and some I cooked for 20 days. Some I allowed to dry for 24 hours, then scrubbed the crusty top layer off. Some I allowed to dry for one hour and carefully picked, with a pair of tweezers, most of the crust away, leaving a wet lower layer to dry and form the patina. Some I simply allowed to dry. Some I allowed to dry for 24 hours, soaked in warm water for 12 hours, then gently removed most of the crusty top mindful not to remove the delicate lower layer of the patina. What a wonderful range of effects, completely and wholly different from anything we've seen so far. Let's have a closer look at some of my favorites. These patinas really illustrate the building and forming of layer over layer of patina. They are earthy and ancient, cloudy and stormy, abstract picturesque and at times iridescent. Let's have a side-by-side -side comparison. I am astounded by ammonia. I never would have guessed so many patina effects could be possible through simple ammonia fuming. From spacey to rustic, to vivid greens to moody blues, from crunchy to smooth, from pictorial landscapes to lightning-filled skies, the range of color, texture, and imagery is phenomenal. And yet, I feel I've only just begun to know ammonia. I truly believe I could spend the next year exploring ammonia all by itself and never get bored. But it was time to move on and introduce ammonia to salt. Actually, I spent a bit of time playing with salt, then came back for a little bit more alone time with ammonia. With the first set of ammonia-only samples, which I cooked for 20 days, I noticed the patina was quite thick and looked a bit muddy. Muddy? Yes, thick and muddy. I kept wondering if I could manipulate the patina mud before it could dry. So I cooked up some more samples. The first sample I cooked for 20 days. Carefully transferred the wet patina to a fume chamber with no ammonia in it. Trust me, you don't want to suck up those ammonia fumes. Then let dry for 10 minutes. 
then poked my finger in it. Hmm, more sticky than muddy. And then I poked some more, and a little bit more, and then a little bit more. As it turned out, once the top layer was poked through, the bottom layer was quite muddy and very stainy. So I put on some gloves and carefully flipped the patina over and poked it with a bit of rolled up paper towel. Let dry for 24 hours and the result? Ooh, yeah, this is a bit of fun. I'm going to pause here. We need to talk about hanging mechanism imprints and cross-contamination. Because the hanging mechanisms I used are made of copper, they will patina. That patina on the copper wires can cross-contaminate the next patina. And because I reused those copper wires over and over again, although I did give them a clean in between, there was some cross-contamination, which does affect the patina, plus the wires themselves can leave an imprint. I considered trying a new hanging method, but decided to continue with the copper wires, as they were easy to use, and I was going to be cooking up hundreds of samples. Plus, I was curious to see if the marks from the copper wires could be exploited and incorporated into the design. Ooh, how? We'll learn more about that in and around Class 20, where we'll explore advanced patina manipulation. I quickly cooked up a second sample with a cook time of 20 days. This time, I allowed no drying time, popped it directly into some nice warm water, and soaked for five minutes. Then gave a shake to see what would come off, then gently brushed off some of the top layers. A little more shaky-shaky, flipped the patina over, a little more brushy-brushy, and more shaky-shaky, and some flicky-flicky. Then let dry for 24 hours. And the result? Who would have thought this vibrant patina was hiding under that dark crust? I cooked up a third sample, this time for 30 days. I wanted more mud. After 30 days, the top crust was quite thick and somewhat dry. So I scrubbed the patina in warm water. The crust of the patina was very solid and did not want to come off. But I was persistent, and eventually a bit of the top crust started to wear away. And of course, I completely forgot about the green staininess of this patina. So I stopped scrubbing, decided to let the patina soak in warm water for 30 minutes, washed my hands, put some gloves on, and continued to scrub. This time a whole chunk of the patina came off. So I stopped scrubbing the patina and allowed to dry for 24 hours. And the result? Wow, look how thick this patina is. And remember that whole chunk that came off? The patina mud was so thick, there's a noticeable difference in thicknesses throughout the entire patina. I cooked up a fourth patina. This time, I got painterly. Using a bit of warm water and a paintbrush, I played with the mud. Looks like you forgot all about those ammonia fumes. Yes, and it was awful. But I didn't want to stop filming, so I continued on, although I did swap it out for an empty fume chamber as soon as I could and let dry for 24 hours. The result? There's a lot of fun to be had manipulating patina mud. Now that I'd gotten to know ammonia a little bit better, I felt it was time to introduce ammonia to salt. Using a paper towel fume chamber, I sprinkled a lot of salt and I sprinkled a little bit of salt and then let cook for one hour and let fully dry. At this point, I was not too impressed and really hoped an increase in cook times would offer up a better result. I repeated the experiment three more times with cook times of two hours, three hours, and four hours. Around hour three, things started looking up. I especially liked sample eight, which led me to one last sample in this grouping, a little bit of salt and a cook time of five hours. At five hours, the salt has completely dissolved and a dark purple outline 
and a light purple haze has appeared. It was at this point that I noticed the dusty olive brown background. It was very similar to sample one in the ammonia only patina group, which you may recall cooked for five hours. This gave me an idea. What would happen if I combined the two patinas? I started with an ammonia only patina. We'll call this the base patina, which first cooked for 12 hours, sprinkled a small amount of salt, and continued cooking for an additional 12 hours for a total cook time of 24 hours, then let completely dry. I was quite pleased with the results. As I had hoped, the ammonia only base patina formed a lovely green and the salt blue. I repeated the experiment three more times with varying cook times. The two patinas have blended together quite nicely to form a smoky, swirly, wispy, watery patina. A very different effect than the salt only samples. Why? Now there's a good question. It's all about moisture. Without moisture, the salt would simply sit there doing nothing. But add a bit of moisture and the salt begins to dissolve, forming the patina. During the cooking process, condensation forms in the fume chamber. The fume chamber acts as a type of ammonia condensation collection system, causing ammonia moisture to form on the copper. These droplets of moisture eventually dissolved the salt, which explains why longer cook times result in, well, more patina, or more blue, if you like. In the case of my mixed patinas, when the salt was added, there was already enough moisture on the ammonia, only base patina, to quickly dissolve the salt, creating a salt solution. Plus, I left the salt cooking between 12 and 24 hours, giving it plenty of time to fully dissolve and form the patina. The moisture also acted as a blending agent, much like water does in watercolor painting allowing the colors to blend into each other. Which brings us nicely into the next group of patina samples. I thought I'd try and speed up the salt dissolving process by first spraying some ammonia and then sprinkling a bit of salt and let cook for two hours. Then let completely dry. And the result? That's a lovely blue. I thought it was time to introduce salt to some other liquids. So I sprayed some water onto a piece of copper and sprinkled a bit of salt. I'm going to pause here and point something out. Poolage. Poolage. Sometimes liquids will pull in or pool towards the center or edge of the copper, otherwise known as poolage. I don't think the poolage is a word. Yes, it is. Can you spell it and use it in a sentence? Poolage. P-O-O-L-I-G-E. Poolage. As I wanted to patina both sides of the copper, I flipped the copper, sprayed and salted the other side, and let cook for two hours. Then let fully dry. The result? Patina poolage. Oh, patina poolage. What causes patina poolage? Many things can cause patina poolage. Well, actually, only two. Firstly, the tendency in liquids to resist separation and remain pooled together, some more so than others. And secondly, gravity. Gravity? How so? It would be near impossible to lay my copper perfectly even within the fume chamber, so any liquid on the copper would gravitate to the lowest point and pool. Is there any way to prevent patina poolage? Yes, and we'll find out how in sample 3. For sample 3, I sprayed soy sauce on copper. Soy sauce? Earlier in the day, I was munching on some sushi and started thinking about soy sauce. If I was experimenting with liquids, why not soy sauce? So I sprayed some soy sauce, sprinkled some salt, and let cook for 30 minutes. At this point, I noticed soy sauce poolage, but I wanted more coverage. Question, what was the cause of the soy sauce poolage? Was this a case of soy sauce patina gravity poolage or soy sauce patina separation anxiety poolage? 
so I changed the placement of the copper, hoping the soy sauce would spread itself around. It didn't. So not soy sauce patina gravity poolage must be separation anxiety poolage. So I used a paintbrush to move the soy sauce and salt around, added a bit more salt, then let cook for an additional one and a half hours for a total cook time of two hours and let completely dry. The result? Ooh, yes. For sample four, I wanted more coverage on both sides. So I sprayed some vinegar. Vinegar? Yes, vinegar. Vinegar came to my attention during my original research into known ammonia patinas. We'll fully explore vinegar for patina making in and around class three or four. There's lots of fun to be had with vinegar. So I sprayed some vinegar, sprinkled some salt, flipped the copper, sprayed some vinegar, sprinkled some salt, let cook for 15 minutes, got painterly, let cook for 15 minutes, flipped the copper, got painterly, sprinkled some salt, let cook for another 15 minutes, flipped the copper, got painterly, sprinkled some salt, let cook for 15 minutes, flipped the copper, and got painterly, sprinkled some salt, then let cook for one hour for a total cook time of two hours, then let fully dry. And the results? Better coverage on both sides. Let's have a look at all four samples. I have to say, I prefer the coverage of painterly to the poolage of au naturel. So I cooked up some more samples and got painterly on water and ammonia. Better coverage, but not much of a difference in color or texture between ammonia and water. Although vinegar shares the same color palette, the texture is very different. Soy sauce shares a similar texture with vinegar, but the colors are quite unique. Adding some salt and playing with different solutions can bring a nice range of color and texture to your patina recipes. I decided to deconstruct salt by completely dissolving it in a liquid which could be dipped or brushed or sprayed on a bit of copper. Then I dissolved two teaspoons of salt in one cup of water, ammonia, vinegar, and soy sauce. As you can see, there's a marked difference in color and textures between the four salt solutions. I repeated the experiment three more times with cook times of two hours, three hours, and four hours. Some I allowed to develop natural poolage and some I got painterly with. It would appear the longer the cook times, the more similar in color and texture water and ammonia become, whereas vinegar and soy sauce remain quite unique. I really wanted to find a patina recipe which would introduce some yellow. Encouraged by my success with vinegar and soy sauce, I decided to give yellow ochre a try. What's yellow ochre and why give it a try? Good questions. I first came across yellow ochre in an art history class. I knew yellow ochre was a natural paint pigment of some kind. In fact, one of the earliest paint pigments discovered by people. Think cave paintings. I thought maybe the minerals in the pigment might react with the ammonia and offer up a yellow patina. So I mixed three teaspoons of yellow ochre natural earth pigment with one cup of water, sprayed, sprinkled some salt. I intended to cook the yellow ochre for two hours, but noticed as the patina cooked, the yellow was disappearing. Since I was looking for yellow, I stopped at one hour, then let completely dry. And the result, hello yellow, and just look at the textures. Although the patina is actually very smooth with a glossy feel, 
I also cooked up a sample with no salt. Curious. No real difference in color or texture. Although the salty yellow ochre patina sample does have bits of speckled dark spots that were likely caused by the salt. After a bit of handling, I noticed some cracks and little bits of patina flaking off. Just how stable was this patina? And was it in fact even a patina? So I decided to give it a wash test. What's a wash test? A wash test is used to determine how stable a patina is and if the patina is actually just a residue. And as for stable, well, let's see. I soaked both patinas in warm water for about 15 minutes, then rubbed my fingers over the patina, slowly increasing the pressure as I went. Conclusion? Not a residue, but an unstable patina. Well, not exactly failed. I have to say, I do like a bit of broken off patina. So really, it comes down to personal taste. It's interesting to note the difference in color between the two wash patinas in regards to the newly exposed copper. And the salty yellow ochre patina sample remained more yellow. I spent some time thinking about this patina and how I could change the recipe and stabilize it. But as I was pondering the nature of stability and how to achieve it, my mind wandered back to the unsalted yellow ochre patina sample. I began to have this nagging question, where did the blue come from? My experience and understanding of achieving this kind of blue with an ammonia patina was that salt was required. There could be some salt or sodium in yellow ochre. It is a mineral after all. But what if that wasn't true? What if water all by itself could create blue? So I sprayed some straight up all by itself water onto a bit of copper and let cook for two hours. Well, it didn't take long. There you have it. Blue. There are moments in time when the whole world shifts. This was one for me. How could this be? Blue without salt. A mystery. Actually, it does make sense since water does have salt in it. Mind you, only trace amounts. Although, obviously enough. I have a confession to make. I didn't actually add any salt to the soy sauce. Soy sauce is pretty salty all on its own. But I did mix it with water. Why? Don't ask me why. I'm not really sure why. Sometimes I'm like that. Sometimes thoughts just pop into my head. I usually follow them. They lead me to the most interesting places. Anyway, I mixed one third cup of soy sauce with two third cups of water. Now I'm wondering what that water did to the soy sauce patina. So I sprayed some pure uncut soy sauce and let cook for two hours. And the result, ew. Yes, not nearly as lovely as the watered down soy sauce patina sample. And now I'm wondering about straight up ammonia and vinegar. So I cooked up some samples. That's a lot of patina poolage. Yes, I wanted to see what pure liquids uninterrupted looked like. So no getting painterly and no added salt and no diluting. The question at this point was, how stable were the liquid-only patinas? And were they in fact patinas or simply a bit of liquid which dried on a bit of copper? I knew what I had to do. The water test. Patina or residue? I'd say patina. Let's have a closer look. I expected this patina to be quite fragile and wash away, but it's actually quite sturdy there was only a bit of blue lost to the wash. As with water, very little loss of blue with ammonia. Vinegar? Unfortunately, the lovely light blue fringe washed away. And soy sauce? Much improved, but almost no blue. But how nice to see some rich browns. I decided to play and see what getting painterly with straight-up soy sauce would offer up. Not what I expected. But interesting, 
I was going to see what getting painterly with straight-up vinegar would offer up, but then remembered. I hoped longer cook times would stabilize the patina, so I cooked up some more samples. Nope. 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 Wait a minute. Can you go back? Nope. Nope. That's the one. Why is it so shiny? Good eye. I hoped to sneak that one past you. Sometimes I'm not as patient as I should be. After washing, I was itching to see if I could stabilize what was left of the patina with a bit of spray lacquer. And in my haste, forgot to get a photo before lacquering. Stabilize with lacquer? Yes. We'll talk in detail about spray lacquer and other sealants in part 2i, preparations and sealing and dealing. I was going to break the budget and run out of copper if I continued on like this. So I jumped ahead to cook times of 72 hours. The yellow's been lost, but in its place is something quite interesting. I was curious to know if they were stable. I was also curious to know if the patinas were not stable. Could I fix them in place with lacquer? And most of all, I was curious to know what was underneath. I decided to see what was underneath and gave them a wash. What it lost in yellow, it gained in stability. And what a difference a little salt makes. One day, when I was downstairs doing some laundry, I noticed an old box of miracle Grow, water-soluble plant food, on one of the shelves. I checked the ingredients. No bleach. I didn't expect to find any, but better safe than sorry. And I thought, why not? So I cooked up a sample and gave it a wash. Wow, lovely. I think this is my favorite solution. Actually, I had several favorite solutions. Now I'm wondering what other solutions are yet to be found. When I first learned about patinas as a student all those years ago, there was mention of the use of wood chips, drizzling ammonia and or vinegar into wood chips and burying the copper for a good length of time. It was never demonstrated, just mentioned. At the time, I filed it away under interesting, should give it a go, but didn't until now. Reactive materials. I thoroughly mixed one half cup of ammonia with three cups of wood chips. The result, moist, but not wet. Then I buried the copper in the wood chip and ammonia mixture and let it cook for four days. And the result? Not exactly a big wow, but a very good starting point. And after a bit more thought, I decided to change the ammonia delivery method. Kind of. I thoroughly mixed. Why change the ammonia delivery method? A very good question. First, too much wood chip waste. Really, one third cup per sample is plenty. Second, I thought if I could increase the contact between the copper and the wood chips with a little bit of pressure, as opposed to the first sample where the copper nestled gently in the wood chips, it might affect the color and texture and offer up something more to my liking. So, I thoroughly mixed one teaspoon of ammonia and one third cup of wood chips, made a wood chip copper wood chip sandwich, wrapped it all up tight in plastic wrap, popped it into a Ziploc bag, and let cook for four days. Unwrapped, gently rinsed in warm water, and let dry. And the result is quite a bit different from the original sample, and much more to my liking. So I cooked up three more samples. I wanted to see the difference between various degrees of wood chip wetness, assuming of course there would be a difference. So played with the ammonia, and left the cook time at a constant four days. I would hazard a guess and say that more ammonia and longer cook times result in more blue and more texture. It would be interesting to see what longer cook times offer up. This is where you come in. If you decide to play with longer cook times, 
you could share those results with us. In a physical classroom, students learn from each other. This is a very important aspect of education. Since our classroom is a virtual classroom, we created forums for our students to interact and share their experiences. Well, actually, since I don't actually have a website, I should say that if you support my Kickstarter project and register as a first-year student and help me produce the first year of classes, my newly hired website development person will create forums for you to interact and share experiences with your fellow students. At the Creating Linus Introduction to the Ammonia Patina Forum, once built, you'll be able to show and tell us all about your patina adventures, ask for advice, and share your discoveries. And of course, I'll show up from time to time to answer questions, as will my newly hired fellow teachers who will bring their own specialties and skills to your classroom. Imagine the amazing database of jewelry techniques we could build together. I spent a bit of time thinking about how I could use leaves as a reactive material. Actually, first I thought about wood chips and different levels of dampness. I must admit, I do have a preference for the least damp wood chip patina sample compared to the most damp wood chip patina sample. I wanted to know what was the cause of the difference in colors and textures. I think it might have something to do with ammonia fumes versus ammonia liquid since the least damp wood chip patina sample was only dampish with ammonia liquid, there would have been very little, if any, ammonia liquid making direct contact with the copper, and the wood chips might have dried out while the patina was cooking. The patina was likely to have been created primarily by ammonia fumes and dryish wood chips, whereas the most damp wood chip patina sample was very damp and would have had ammonia liquid and damp wood chips sitting directly on top of the copper, as well as more ammonia fumes. Armed with this hypothesis, I decided against soaking the leaves in ammonia. Rather, I found an absorbent cloth to act as an ammonia fume delivery method. And I made a leaf copper leaf sandwich wrapped it in an absorbent cloth, tied with a bit of yarn, drizzled two teaspoons of ammonia, popped into a zip bag, a little squeezy squeezy, and let cook for three days, soaked in warm water for 20 minutes, carefully removed the cloth and leaf debris, and let dry for 24 hours. The results? Very interesting and definitely very leafy. So I cooked up some more samples. My first impression is a sense of image transference, very reminiscent of old-fashioned hand-tinted black and white photography. But I get the feeling these patinas could benefit from longer cook times and making sure all the leaves are flat against the copper. I was quite pleased with the results from wrapped, tied, and drizzled but also felt I should explore more ammonia delivery methods and see what I could come up with. This time I used two different kinds of single leaves, but no clusters, as I felt singles would sit flatter against the copper and form a better imprint. I'll play with clusters later. I soaked a bit of cloth in ammonia, squeezed until damp, and created a cloth leaf copper leaf cloth sandwich, popped it into a zip bag, and let cook for three days, and carefully removed the cloth and leaf debris. And the results? So I'm going to pause right here for a moment. We need to talk about the top and the bottom. This is the bottom, and this is the top. Very different. With some ammonia delivery methods, there will be a marked difference between the top and the bottom. In the case of soaking, squeezing, and covering, this is because the top of the patina would have formed while the reactive material and ammonia were sitting on the copper, whilst the bottom of the patina would have formed with the reactive materials and ammonia sitting under the copper. The patina forming on the top will always have gravity working for it, whereas the patina forming on the bottom will always have gravity working against it. Couldn't you just flip the patina over every once in a while so they cook equally on both sides? 
Absolutely. Flipping the patina while it's forming will have an effect of some kind and might even equal out the size. But flipping the patina could also move the leaf about, which could affect how the leaf image forms. I decided not to flip during this set of samples, but it is something I will have a closer look at in the future. Let's have a look at wrapped, tied, and drizzled versus dipped, squeezed, and covered. Well, there would appear to be a difference between wrapping, tying, and drizzling and dipping, squeezing, and covering. Something to keep in mind. I set up a fume chamber and place the leaf flat against the copper. I know from experience that a flat leaf forms a better impression. Then I sprayed an ammonia salt solution. Why the different spray bottle? Because I was going to be playing with so many different solutions, I purchased my spray bottles by the case from a local packaging company. But I thought I should also try a more commonly found spray bottle, which I found at my local dollar store for a dollar. About halfway through cooking, I decided there was too much ammonia salt solution and used a bit of paper towel to draw off some of the liquid. Why? Turns out, the larger spray bottle sprays more liquid. From experience, I know that a wet patina will dry lighter and can be more fragile. I made a judgment call and removed some of the liquid, hoping the patina would be darker and more stable. And I think I made the right decision. Because once cleaned and dry, I really like this patina. Clearly, different leaves and different ammonia delivery methods will offer up different effects. Wait a minute, what's the patina in the corner? You never showed us that one. Didn't I? No. Nope. Oh, <laughs> silly me. One day, my mum was cooking up some beet leaves. I thought, why not? So I cooked up a sample. Clearly, different leaves. And different ammonia delivery methods will offer up different effects. I was really lazy for a couple of weeks and did not cut the grass, which resulted in some really long grass. Perfect for making patinas. So I wrapped the grass around a bit of copper, then wrapped it all up in cloth, drizzled three teaspoons of ammonia, popped into a zip bag, a little squeezy squeezy, and cooked for three days. After soaking in warm water, I removed the grass debris, and the result? What lovely, dynamic movement. There's a lot of energy in the blending of blues and greens, and the lines created by the long grass. So I cooked up three more samples. There's something almost painterly about these patinas, with layers of color and quick, decisive brush strokes. Who knew? Wood chips, leaves, and grass could offer up such wonderful patinas. I had to try flowers, so on a beautiful summer day, lacking my own flower garden, I snuck into my neighbor's garden, Bob and Elaine, who were away on holidays, and borrowed a few poppies. But how to use them? The poppies were just too puffy to allow for good poppy to copper contact. So I plucked the poppy petals and made a poppy petal copper poppy petal sandwich, wrapped, tied, drizzled two teaspoons of ammonia, a bit on both sides, popped into a zip bag, a little squeezy squeezy, and let cook for four days, soaked in warm water for 10 minutes, and carefully removed the poppy petal debris. After allowing to dry, I brushed off any dried poppy petal debris, but the surface of the patina was dusty with a chalky residue, so I gently washed in warm water and allowed to dry. And here it is. Clearly, the second washing has made a big difference in the color and definition of the poppy petal patina. I was very surprised by the result of this patina, as I did not expect such poppy petal definition. The patina actually looks like flower petals. I cooked up three more samples. Can I just say wow? I mean, really wow? I have to say, at that point, I was hooked on ammonia patinas. I snuck back into Bob and Elaine's garden, they were still away on holidays, and borrowed a few more flowers, roses, and purple dahlias, and cooked up a whole bunch of samples with rose and purple dahlia petals. 
repeating the same ammonia delivery method as the poppy petal patina. Much to my surprise, a very different result from the poppy petal patina. And how about the purple dahlia petal patina? Also very different. Clearly, different flowers bring something unique to the patina. Let's have a look at all the flower petal patinas. Unlike the poppy petal patina, I would not have guessed flower petals were used to create the rose petal patina. Why do you think that is? That's a very good question. It's all about coverage. I completely covered the copper with rose petals, whereas I used the poppy petals sparingly. This would have had an effect on the patina and the petal definition. The purple dahlia petal patina definitely has petal definition, but not in the same way as the poppy petal definition in the poppy petal patina. As with leaves, different flower petals and how those petals are arranged on the copper will result in different flower petal patina effects. Actually, before we move on, I want to make a note of an observation. During the leaf patina portion of my research, I took note of a texture that I believed was created by the cloth I wrapped the leaf patina in. The same texture was noticeable in both the purple dahlia patina and the poppy petal patina, but not in the rose petal patina. Can anyone guess why that is? Too many rose petals. Good memory. With the rose petal samples, the copper was completely covered in rose petals, so the cloth was unable to make contact with the copper. This texture is very noticeable in the leaf patinas, and possibly exploitable. But I'm going to tuck that bit of observation behind my ear and let it sit for a bit. I decided to grind up the petals and center bits of three poppies with two teaspoons of ammonia. I would recommend doing this outdoors as the ammonia fumes are quite strong. Strained the poppy petal pulp and painted the poppy petal juice onto a bit of copper. Flipped and painted poppy petal juice onto the other side. Then I decided to use up that poppy petal and ammonia pulp by putting it onto a bit of copper and adding some poppy petal juice. Flipped, poppy pulped and painted the other side, then let them both cook for two hours. Allowed to dry and washed where necessary. And the results? I cooked up a second poppy petal pulp sample, but this time no poppy petal juice. But I did spray a couple pumps of an ammonia and salt solution. Most interesting. I wonder what ground up rose petals and purple dahlia petal patinas would look like. Or, come to think of it, leaves and grass. There's a whole garden full of organics waiting to be played with. The Humble Yellow Onion A somewhat obvious choice given its pugnant excretions. Natural chemicals likely to interact and react with ammonia. And boy, do they! I worked with thinly sliced, then halved, and finely chopped onions. I made an onion, copper, onion sandwich, wrapped in cloth and drizzled one teaspoon of ammonia, popped into a zip bag, a little squeezy squeezy, and cooked for four days. After soaking in warm water, I carefully removed the cloth and onion debris, but found the onions did not want to come off. Rather than pull harder and risk damage to the patina, I let the patina dry for 24 hours, then gently brushed the dried onion debris off. But the patina was very chalky, so I gently washed the patina in warm water. And the result? Once again, the landscape has changed completely. As the results between chopped and sliced onions are so different, let's have a look at the two patinas separately. We'll do sliced onions first. I cooked up some more samples. What a wild ruckus of colors, textures, and forms. Let's have a look up close. Quite astonishing. What a lovely wash of colors, blues, greens, browns, and a purple haze. Just look at those copper veins. There is definitely a sense of abstract imagery. Let's have a look at the bottom. 
I could have used paint and canvas to create this energetic blend of colors. Here too are layers of blues, greens, browns, purple, and copper veins, but I didn't. This is all Mother Nature's work. I'm really digging onions. Let's have a look at. It's like watching something grow under a microscope. There's so much visual texture. Although, if you ran your finger across the patina, you could feel the surface is quite flat. One day, I was eating rice and thought, I wonder what would happen if I... So I made a soy sauce rice copper soy sauce rice sandwich, wrapped it in cloth, drizzled two teaspoons of ammonia, popped into a zip bag, a little squeezy squeezy, and cooked for four days. Then I soaked in warm water for five minutes, gently removed rice bits, mindful not to pull off the patina. And well, I have to say, really like. I also thought I should have a rice-only sample to compare, so I cooked one up. Interesting. The overall texture is the same, but the colors are very different. It would appear rice and ammonia all by themselves create blues and purples whereas soy sauce brings a titch of green to the blue and adds a blackish brown. You know I had to stop and play. So I cooked up some more samples, nine more to be precise, but decided not to show them in this tutorial. During my research, I cooked up over 300 samples. I'm not going to show them all in this tutorial. We could be here all day. But you can see most of them at our Creating Linus Facebook page. Why only most? At this point, I'm not willing to commit to all of my patina samples ending up on Creating Linus's Facebook. Why not? Frankly, I didn't have enough time or budget to process all 300 plus patina samples and get them onto our Facebook page all by myself. But there are additional samples for you to have a look at and I'll continue to post new patina samples when I can. So do have a look. Which brings me to our Facebook page. Please friend us. Then you can post images of your patina samples and finished flower earrings and tell us all about them. I made a radish copper radish sandwich wrapped in cloth, drizzled one teaspoon of ammonia, popped into a zip bag, a little squeezy squeezy, and cooked for four days. After soaking in warm water, the radish, like the onion before it, did not want to come off. So I let dry for 24 hours and carefully removed the radish debris. As expected, the patina was chalky, so I gave it a gentle wash in warm water. The result, holy freaky eyeball, Batman. You know, I had to cook up some more samples. What can I say? Freaky, spacey, eyeball-y, celly? Celly, you know, like cells in the body and somewhat disturbing. I really like them. So one day, I uh, grated some red radishes and made a grated red radish copper grated red radish sandwich wrapped in cloth, tied with a bit of yarn, drizzled one teaspoon of ammonia, popped into a zip bag, a little squeezy squeezy, and cooked for three days. After soaking in warm water, the grated red radish was still stuck like glue. It took three days to fully dry. I carefully removed the dried red radish debris. As expected, the patina was chalky. So I gave it a gentle wash in warm water. The result? Very lovely. You know I like my greens. Now I'm wondering what strained grated red radish pulp and red radish juice would offer up. Let's have a side-by-side -side look. Again, we see a very distinctive difference between different reactive materials. We also begin to see a distinctive difference between how those reactive materials are used. Like many craft artists, I've always had an interest in other craft arts. And like many craft artists, I find there is often opportunity for crossover both in materials and techniques. We'll learn more about that in around class 10 when we play with alternative materials. For now, we'll be using textile alternative materials as reactive materials for our patinas. 
Alternative materials? Anything not metal or stone is considered an alternative material. So bone, wood, resin, wool fibers, plastic, ceramics, anything really. Sea glass, hemp, found objects, tin cans can be used to make jewelry. Textiles, also known as the fiber arts, are a particular interest of mine, so I couldn't resist trying out a few textile bits and bobs. You may have noticed the green yarn I've been using to wrap my patinas up in. Well, eventually I started thinking, I wonder what would happen if I... So I moistened a bit of yarn with one teaspoon of ammonia. I also cooked up a second sample using one teaspoon of an ammonia salt solution, squeezed until damp, and wrapped, and wrapped, and wrapped, a little bit more, a little more, bit some more wrapping, some more wrapping, a bit more, around a bit of copper. Popped into a zip bag, a little rub rub, a little pat pat, and let cook for four days. Unwrapped, unwrapped, and unwrapped all of that yarn. Then washed in warm water, and the result? Quite the difference between the two. I can see real potential for this patina. Why? I would imagine different yarns will yield different results. What kind of yarn are you using? I'm afraid I'm not sure what this yarn is as it was given to me, but I would guess a wool polyester blend. Why would the type of yarn matter? I should think different fibers will absorb the ammonia differently and offer up a range of results. Why change the ammonia delivery method? Yeah, why not just wrap, tie, and drizzle? Actually, that's a very good question. Initially, I did wrap a bit of dry yarn around a bit of copper and then wrapped, tied, and drizzled, but was very disappointed in the results. So I decided to try a different ammonia delivery method, one where there would be more direct contact between the ammonia, yarn, and copper. Although wrapping, tying, and drizzling is not my favorite delivery method for yarn, there is something in this patina that wants to come out. Perhaps playing with cook times and more or less ammonia might yield more of what this patina wants to be. Needless to say, this patina is worth exploring, but I'll leave that for you to play with. Remember that bit of observation I tucked behind my ear to explore later? Yes. Well, eventually it started making some noise. It wanted to know, can cloth be used as a reactive material? Naturally, I started with the microfiber dishcloth used to wrap up my patinas. I soaked a bit of cloth in an ammonia salt solution, squeezed until damp, made a cloth copper cloth sandwich, popped into a zip bag, and let cook for four days. I also dug through my cloth pile and cooked up some samples using a printed cotton cloth, a loose weave synthetic cloth, a tight weave synthetic cloth, a wool felt cloth, a bit of J cloth, and a heavy textured upholstery of unknown fiber cloth. After cooking for four days, I let soak in warm water for about 15 minutes. Carefully removed the cloth from the top and carefully removed the cloth from the bottom. And the results? Um, I'm really sorry, but the film is very poorly lit. You can hardly even tell what's going on with that patina. It's so dark. If you enroll as a first-year student and support my Kickstarter project, I'll be able to hire a camera person who knows how to light a scene properly and can even keep everything in focus. All the time! Just imagine, what would that be like? In focus and well-lit all the time! I thank you in advance, as I am looking forward to having everything in focus and well-lit all the time. The patina is a tinsy bit chalky, so I gave it a final gentle wash in warm water. And the result? What a lovely dark blue. Heavy, heavy texture. Note to self. Next time, soak in water longer, as some of the patina stuck to the cloth and was pulled off. Maybe try one hour next time? Very microfiber dish clothy. 
There's definitely a connection between the microfiber dishcloth and the patina texture. The printed cotton cloth did yield an image beyond texture and one which was obviously related to the printed image, but did not affect the color of the patina. No red dye transference. After much thought, it occurred to me that the ink used on the surface of the cloth clogged up the weave of the cloth and in essence acted as a resist, which gave me a thought which led me to lace which made me wonder, with its positive and negative space, what would happen if I covered, sprayed, and fumed a bit of lace? Ooh, we'll put that thought aside for now. No! It was a dark and stormy night. What a wonderfully moody, atmospheric patina, and wholly unexpected. But if you look closely, the stars in the night were created by the little white nubbins in the cloth. Not too much joy here, but there's clear evidence that the patina wants to form, so maybe playing with longer cook times could yield up better results. And maybe making sure the contact between copper and cloth is a good one. The more I look at this patina, the more I like it. Although it's quite dark, there are many layers of dark and light blues, dark and light greens, bits of purple and black. Again, we see a definite relationship between the cloth used, felt wool, and the resulting patina textures. I wonder what raw wool will produce. And the J-cloth? Well, not my favorite, but the heavy textured upholstery made up for it. The highs and lows of the heavy textured upholstery have formed strips of alternating patina effects. I was having so much fun, I decided to see what ammonia, all by itself, and cloth, would do. What a lovely range of colors and textures. I wonder what wrapped, tied, and drizzled cloth would look like. But I'll leave that up to you. Time to explore that thought about lace. Yes, well first, this happened. And then, this is what happened. And then this happened. And in the end, this is what happened. I'm quite happy with what happened. So much so I gave two more bits of lace a try. It would appear lace makes an excellent patina resist, although the results will differ depending on how tight or loose the weave is, as well as copper to lace contact, not to mention how wet or how dry the patina is. Let's have a look at lace sample number two. In some areas, the weave is just too tight. The ammonia can't get in to do its thing, but it created a nice contrast between patina and bare copper highlighting the image in much of the same way as the tight and loose areas in the weave are used to define the flower image in the lace itself. Lace sample number three has some areas of tight weave, but also has raised areas which make it difficult for the lace to make contact with the copper. A little pokey pokey after spraying the ammonia salt solution would help to increase lace to copper contact. And just for fun, I cooked up one last sample Three very different yet similar patina effects. Why is that? Good question. I think these three samples illustrate nicely the touchiness of patina making. It would seem the smallest change in a patina recipe will have an effect on the results. Something to keep in mind when playing with lace. Paper is considered a fiber art as it's made with fibers. Upon reflection, I should have used some nice fibery handmade paper, but the inspiration for using watercolor paper came during a lecture I was giving on using watercolor paper in roller printing. What's roller printing? Roller printing is using a rolling mill to create embossed patterns, images, and textures in metal. We'll learn all about roller printing, hammer marks, punches, and etching in and around class three, the introduction to textures, images, and pattern making. As I was explaining the versatility of watercolor paper in roller printing as an image maker, I thought, I wonder if watercolor paper 
could be used as a resist in patina making. So I cooked up a sample using a paper towel fume chamber and a salt ammonia solution, which I let cook for two hours. Then let dry for one hour. As the watercolor paper stuck to the copper, I soaked it in warm water for about 15 minutes, at which point the watercolor paper came off easily without pulling the patina off with it. And the results? A whole new world of image making suddenly opened up. Very exciting! You know I had to stay and play. I made a whole bunch of samples. I cooked a second sample, this time for three hours, then let dry for about 10 minutes. Carefully, with tweezers, removed the watercolor paper. There was a lot of liquid, so much so I was concerned the lovely blue heart which had just formed would end up wiped out by the now spreading patina liquid. But the patina liquid formed into a bright robin egg blue mixed with a purple haze. Just a bit of the heart was covered, which gave the patina an overall look of swirly, watery movement, which I quite like. Where did all the patina liquid come from? It was hiding under the watercolor paper. Remember, I only let the patina dry for about 10 minutes, not enough time to let the patina liquid, or juice, dry. The removal of the watercolor paper released the trapped patina juices which swarmed and swirled around the heart while they dried, unlike sample one, which had one hour to dry, giving the patina juices plenty of time to dry. Next, I cooked a bit of copper in a paper towel fume chamber for four days. I was hoping to add a bit of green. Quickly, so as not to let the base patina dry, but carefully, I placed a positive watercolor heart on the base patina. Sprayed two pumps of an ammonia salt solution, let cook for two hours, and let fully dry. As the watercolor paper stuck to the copper, I soaked it in warm water for about 10 minutes, at which point the watercolor paper came off easily, and let fully dry. The result? Well, I did get a bit of green, but decided to cook up two more samples to see if I could get more green. I started with a base patina, which first cooked for seven days. Quickly, so as not to let the base patina dry, but carefully, I placed a positive watercolor heart on the base patina, sprayed both samples with an ammonia salt solution, letting one sample cook for two hours and the other sample for 14 hours. Let dry for one hour, soaked in warm water, let fully dry, And the result? Interesting. Two very, very different patinas. And I found more green. I also cooked up some other solutions. Watered down soy sauce, vinegar and salt, and water and salt. Now those are some nice solutions, which inspired me to cook more samples. I think this patina best illustrates the truly one-of-a-kind nature of patinas. I don't believe I could exactly reproduce even one of these patina results, no matter how closely I follow the recipe. When playing with patinas, it's important to expect that a specific patina recipe can yield a range of effects. Although you can't expect to recreate the exact patinas in this video, you can expect a predictable range of results with each patina recipe. My advice to you is make a few samples, play with patinas, and get a feel for them. Then play with your flowers. Or you could just jump in and start making flowers. If you end up with something you don't like, stare at it for a few days and see if it grows on you. Could happen. If it doesn't, emery it off and start over. But don't forget to suit up for safety. Be sure to wear a dust mask. You don't want to breathe in patina dust. Don't give up. Learn from each patina. Don't forget to share on our Creating Linus Facebook page. When I was a student, I was taught to prep your copper by removing all oxides and grease 
before applying a patina. Why? A patina is a surface treatment which is often unstable. A natural patina forms over time, taking days, years, decades, hundreds, or even thousands of years to form. The patina grabs hold, invading, eroding, and spreading across the metal surface, otherwise known as bite. Bite? Bite. As the patina forms, it etches into the surface of the metal, grabbing hold and biting onto it. The more bite a patina has, the better hold it will have on the metal. As a general rule, longer cook times will result in more bite. Although, cook times are only one factor in a patina's bite. Since we're creating a forced patina with relatively short cook times, removing all grease and oxides will help with patina bite. As a student, I did this by emmering the surface. Not a lot of fun, but very effective. I would recommend using a 220 emery grit pad or a sanding disc with a rotary tool. Be sure to remove the entire surface. Emmering has the added benefit of creating tiny grooves which gives the patina something easy to bite onto, helping to stabilize the patina. Or so I was told. I never questioned it until now. I decided a little experiment was in order. So I cooked up six samples with six different copper preparation methods. So I gave my freshly emeried bit of copper four pumps of an ammonia salt solution and let cook for two hours in a paper towel fume chamber. And the results? Very good and even patina coverage. Depending on the object, it's not always possible to emery away oxides and grease. With three-dimensional objects, chemical removal of oxides and grease becomes necessary. Since I have access to a torch, when emery is not an option, heating and pickling the copper is my second favorite method of removing oxides and grease. Pickling? In the olden days, metalsmiths used to use hot vinegar to clean metal, which they called pickling. Vinegar is mildly acidic. Given enough time, hot vinegar will remove oxides and grease. These days, vinegar has been replaced by Sparex No. 2, a mild granular acid mixed with water, which can be used cold or hot. Pickle is more effective hot. A crock pot is a good way to keep pickle hot, but never let your pickle boil, as the fumes can be nauseous. Whether you're pickling your copper or cooking your roast, never let your crock pot boil dry, as this could be a fire hazard. And it goes without saying, don't use the same crock pot to pickle your metal in that you cook your dinner in. Set your crock pot to its lowest setting. For every one cup of boiling hot water, Add one tablespoon of Sparex number two. Stir until the Sparex is fully dissolved. If you don't have a crock pot, use a glass or a ceramic container. You'll also need to mix up a bit of pickle neutralizer. Don't forget, pickle is an acid. Mild, it's not going to melt your face off, but it will irritate skin and eyeballs. So anything which touches pickle must be rinsed in a baking soda water neutralizing rinse. For the next bit, you'll need a torch. Move the torch over the metal slowly and evenly. The copper will go through a series of color changes. You might see yellow, blue, green, and purples. Once the copper is turned black, look for a dull red under the black. At this point, the copper is hot enough. Allow the copper to cool for about 30 seconds. Quench in water and into the pickle it goes. Pickle until clean and rinse. What are those dark copper blotches? Just a bit of leftover copper oxides, but I like to call them copper poopies. You'll need to wipe the copper poopies off. The copper is now prepared for the patina. So I gave both samples four pumps of an ammonia salt solution and cooked for two hours in a paper towel fume chamber. Very good patina coverage on both samples. Since I already had some cold pickle, I thought I'd give it a test. So I pickled a bit of copper without putting it to the torch first for 12 hours. 
Then I gave it four pumps of an ammonia salt solution and cooked for two hours in a paper towel fume chamber. Hmm. Also, very good patina coverage. I thought I should try a grease and wax remover from a store. So I went down to my local hardware store and purchased and followed the manufacturer's directions. Yet again, very good patina coverage. Very interesting. I also cooked up a bit of copper with no preparations. Surprisingly, also very good patina coverage. But how stable are these patinas? There's only one way to find out, so I gave them a wash test. Hmm, none of the patinas survived the wash test completely intact. But that's okay. Ultimately, it's not about how much patina is not on the copper, but how much you like the patina which is on the copper. It's all about personal taste. I always tell my students, it's good if you like it. I personally do like patinas which have a bit of copper showing through. I think it gives it a bit of character. But if you prefer more coverage, as we've learned, Increased cook times will improve overall patina coverage. There are a number of different ways to seal your patina, including spray on lacquers, paint on lacquers, which can also be dipped in lacquers, and rub on, rub off waxes. As all patinas are unique, there's no one single sealer or sealer process that can seal them all. Keep in mind that all sealers will alter the patina in some way. Sometimes it will heighten colors, and sometimes it will remove colors. It's a gamble, but here are a few tips. Anytime you are working with sealers, whether they are spray-on or paint-on lacquers, or rub-on, rub-off waxes, be sure to do so in a well-ventilated room. Open up some doors and windows, or do it outside if you can, as the fumes can be harmful. Don't forget to wear protective eyewear. You don't want lacquer in your eyeballs. And always read and follow the manufacturer's directions. My go-to sealer for any new patina is spray. Spray sealers are available at your local hardware store or a local art supply store or online and will come in matte, semi-gloss, and gloss. I prefer a slow approach to spray sealing many, 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 many thin layers with about a half an hour of dry time in between layers. How many? A minimum of three, but some patinas will require many, many more, as many as 15 or 20 layers. Experience will let you know how many layers a specific type of patina will require, but the crunchier or less stable a patina is, the more layers of sealer will be required to help stabilize it. There are many paint-on lacquers to choose from, available at your local jewelry supply shop, local hardware store, or online. But, surprisingly, clear nail polish works really nicely. I purchased mine from my local dollar store for a dollar. Two or three thin layers are best. More is not always better with paint-on lacquers. Too many layers can cause peeling. Paste waxes are a very traditional way to seal patinas. Liquid beeswax, super hard shell turtle wax, or my favorite, Renaissance wax polish, will all do the job quite nicely, but are not as hardy as spray or paint on lacquers, and not so good for fragile or patinas with lots of nooks and crannies. Gently rub on with a dry soft cloth, allow to dry for about five minutes. Then gently polish with a soft, dry cloth. As with spray lacquers, I like a minimum of three layers. When it comes to choosing the right sealer for your patina, experience will let you know what works best, otherwise known as trial and error. Not always fun. Although, if you don't want to fuss with different sealers, my advice is to stick with spray lacquers.
To form the ear wires, you'll need two pieces of 18 gauge sterling silver round wire, about 10.5 centimeters in length. If you look real close, you'll see there's a little ball on the end of the earring wire. The ball holds the copper flower in place and gives the earring wire a nice detail. This ball was made by using a torch to melt the end of a wire. This is called balling up wire. Does that mean I need a torch? No. Well, yes, you do need a torch to ball up wire. For those of you who have access to a torch, I'll show you how to ball up wire. And for those of you who don't have access to a torch, I'll show you how to make an earring wire pretty close to this one without using a torch. For those of you who have access to a torch, I'm going to assume you know how to use one. I'm not going to explain all about torches and how to use them, not today, but I will in and around class two in the tutorial, The Introduction to the Torch. Balling up wire is pretty simple. The hottest point in the flame is just in front of the cone. This is where you want the end of your wire. Hold it nice and steady, just in front of the cone. And there you are, a lovely little ball on the end of your wire. Don't forget to pickle, nice and clean. How do you make sure your balls are the same size? Good question. I like to ball up my first ear wire and lay it on the fire brick. This way I can compare the second one. Hmm, a little small. Back into the flame it goes. I'd say that'll do. Oh, uh, miss, my balls keep falling off. Your balls keep falling off. My balls keep falling off. Oh, your balls keep falling off. That's because they're too big. Too big. When balling up wire, solid metal becomes liquid. And at a certain point, gravity wins and the liquid metal balls drop off. So be mindful of making your balls too big. I love making jigs. A good jig will make production pieces easier, faster, and more consistent. What's a production piece? Sometimes I make a design once, resulting in a one-of-a-kind piece of jewelry. But sometimes I make a design multiple times. That's when a design becomes a production piece. A well-designed and thought-out production piece can be a good little money earner. If you intend to make and sell jewelry, a production line can get you selling quickly. When I learn a new technique, I like to design production pieces around that technique. Repeating a technique over and over again is one of the best ways to master new techniques. We'll talk more about production techniques in and around class three. The basic flower earring is one of my production designs. I like to make them 20 pairs at a time. So making a jig is well worth the time and effort. I find it helpful to add a couple of lines to my jig. Draw a line 90 degrees to the long end of the dowel. A bit of masking tape is very helpful, but I prefer a soft measuring tape as it is thicker and helps guide the pencil better than eyeball the center line and repeat. You'll need to make some registration marks. Measuring from the end of the ball, trim your wire down to nine centimeters in length. Divide the wires in half then divide each half in half. Extend the marks all the way around the wire. Place the first mark on the center line, bend the wire around the dowel, but do not bend beyond the second mark. Rotate the ball until it's pointing straight up at you. Place the third mark on the center line. Bend the wire around the dowel, but again, do not bend beyond the second mark. You should have a nice, soft S curve. Let's have a look from a different angle. Next, place the second mark on the center line. Be sure the ball is curving down and bend around the dowel until your hands meet in the center. If you've got a vise, you might as well use it, but be sure to center the center line. You can, of course, simply hold the dowel by hand. It's a bit tricky, 
but doable. Look around and see what you have that will work. I found an old film canister and a pen. Sometimes you'll end up with a wonky ear wire, but a little fussing and farting, and there you have it, a nicely formed ear wire. Your jig does not need to be beautiful. It just needs to get the job done. For those of you who don't have access to a torch, here's the workaround. You'll need a steel block and a metal hammer. Any old metal hammer will do. Please note, if your wire has a curve, placement on the steel block will be important. Be sure to place the curve curving up and centered. Forge out the end of the wire. The end of the wire should be flat and flared. If your wire had a bit of a curve and you placed it correctly on the steel block, your wire should look like this. Lucky me, my local jewelry supply shop had some nice 3 mm sterling silver round beads with a 1 mm hole, which fit perfectly on the end of my ear wire. I'm going to leave this bit of flared end long, but if you don't like it, uh, I don't like it. If you don't like it, snip it off. Don't snip too close. Your balls could pop off. Either way, you'll want to give it a good emery to remove sharp edges. Nice and smooth, not snaggy. Nicole, why is this wire curved but the balled up wire was straight? That's a very good question. The process of making wire leaves the wire very, very hard and springy. My local jewelry supply shop only sells wire half hard. Half hard? When wire is freshly made, it's rock hard, which is actually what it's called, rock hard. Annealing the metal will soften it. Annealing? Annealing is the process of using heat to soften metal. I'll go into great detail about the annealing process in an Around Class 3, Introduction to Annealing. But for now, all you need to know is heat will soften metal. So, when using a torch to ball up wire, chances are very good the wire will get hot enough to soften, which enabled me to easily straighten it with my fingers. The wire for my cold balls came from my local jewelry supply shop, half hard. But it is possible to have a range to choose from depending on where you purchase your wire from, that is. Here are the options. Rock hard, hard, half hard, soft, and dead soft. If you have the option, purchase your wire soft or dead soft. This will make it much easier to form your ear wires. But then won't the ear wires be soft? Not usually. The process of forming wire will work hard in the metal. It should end up quite springy. Regardless of whether your balls are hot or cold, You'll need to emery the end of the ear wire nice and smooth. Finally, add your flower. That doesn't look right. No, it does not. A little tweaking with a pair of round nose pliers is required. You'll need to give the ball end a bit of a bend. 90 degrees should do. And there you have it. The basic flower earring, all finished. Actually, one last thing. There are a number of ways to shine up your ear wires. Wet the brass brush and apply a liberal amount of liquid soap. Scrub your wire gently until the felt marker is removed and the ear wire is nice and shiny. To clean your brass brush, rinse all the soap off, give the brass brush a good shake to remove the water, and dry it with a cloth. Otherwise, your brush will become matted and rust. Wet a bit of steel wool, add some soap, and gently scrub until the felt marker is removed and the ear wire is nice and shiny. If you happen to have access to a tumbler and some metal shot, tumbling for about 15 minutes will get the job done nicely. We'll talk more about the tumbler in and around Class 2 in the tutorial, Introduction to the Tumbler. 
the basic flower earring was inspired by a droopy flower. At the time, I was exploring earring wires as a design element, not just something to hang earrings off of. As a jewelry artist, I'm often torn between form and function. Jewelry, by definition, must be worn on the body. This is its function. But as an artist, I'm more interested in design and concept, otherwise known as form, and they can be at odds with each other. We'll talk more about form and function in and around Class 3 in the tutorial, The Nature of Ear Wires. Your assignment for this project is to create one pair of flower earrings. I've designed the ear wire for you. You'll need to design the flower. Here are a few things to think about. A very important question when designing earrings. I drew this flower this way, but it insisted on hanging this way. That's because the heaviest part of an object, when hung, will usually find its way to the bottom. Gravity. When designing a new piece and making it for the first time, I don't always finish making it as its main purpose is to see how it functions. Is it too heavy, too light, too big, too small? Did I make the right material choices? How does it hang? No point in finishing a piece if it's not hanging properly. I normally would have started over, altering the design while keeping gravity in mind. But the patina plays a large role in the design and I wanted to see what difference it might bring to the overall effect and how I felt about how it hung. As it turns out, once I got over my need to control everything, it's one of my favorite flowers, a happy accident. Also, a very important question when designing earrings, but not an easy question to answer. Obviously, you don't want to cause the wearer of your earrings any pain or damage. If you like large earrings, then make large earrings. However, when you go large, material choices do matter, specifically metal thickness. Thicker metal will obviously be heavier than thinner metal. But I advise against using metal thinner than 22 gauge. You can use 22 gauge, just don't go thinner. Why? As copper is a soft metal, thin copper tends to bend easily. I would be concerned about flowers holding their form. Unfortunately, experience will let you know which materials are best for which designs. But not all earrings are meant to be worn all day at the office. Some are meant for a few hours at a dinner party or the theater. So sometimes a little heavy is okay. Since this is your first piece, keep it simple and design something you'd like to wear or would like to make, something you find visually appealing. And don't worry if it's good. Each piece you design and make will teach you how to improve the next piece. You have to start somewhere, so jump in and get started. You'll need to get your flower onto a piece of label paper. If you use a computer to design with, simply print onto a full sheet of label paper. You can, of course, simply draw onto a piece of label paper. You can transfer a drawing from another bit of paper by photocopying it onto full sheet label paper. Or use the tracing paper trick. Here are a few of my flower creations.
Your assignment is to use the droopy flower earring wire as a starting point and design and make one pair of copper flower earrings which are finished with an ammonia patina. But that doesn't mean you can't make more. They make nice gifts. You could even design a line of basic flower earrings that you show and sell to your friends, loved ones, and colleagues. Who knows? It could even fund your classes. Whether you make one pair or a hundred pairs, we'd love to see and hear about them. You can post your flowers on our Creating Linus Facebook page. And don't forget to support my Kickstarter project and help me produce the first year of classes by enrolling as a first-year student. You'll also get a great deal, like half off first year's tuition. So please do pop over to my Kickstarter page and find out more. Often, as in life, in jewelry making, there's more than one way to get to the same place. When it comes to cutting sheet metal, the guillotine shear, jeweler's handsaw, various hand shears, or a bench shear will all get you there. But with some pluses and minuses to take into consideration when choosing which tool to cut your sheet metal with. When it comes to cutting quick and accurate straight lines without distorting the metal, the guillotine shear scores high marks. The guillotine shear has four main parts. The table, the handle, the blade, and fourth, the blade guard, which I have removed temporarily for this demonstration. When a manufacturer takes the time and money to include a safety feature to keep you from shaving down your fingers, use it. Here are the basics. As the handle moves up and down, so does the blade move up and down. Simply draw a cut line on the metal, slide the metal on the table and under the blade, line the cut line up with the blade edge, a good hard pull down on the handle, and the metal is stayed nice and flat with no distortions. That's a pretty big plus. But the guillotine shear comes with some equally big minuses. The first is cost. A 4-inch guillotine shear, which is what I have, costs about $400 US, plus shipping. I couldn't find it local, so I ordered it online. There are also some cutting limitations. My 4-inch guillotine shear can't cut sheet metal wider than 4 inches. The metal can be any length, but no wider than 4 inches. Additionally, the guillotine shear can only cut straight lines, which means no curves. A limitation, yes, but you can do a lot with straight lines. Is the guillotine shear a must-have tool in the studio? No. Don't get me wrong, I love my guillotine shear. It's a real time saver in the studio. But spend your studio dollars on tools and materials you really must have first, then get tools which save on time. Which brings us to the jeweler's handsaw, which is a must-have tool in the studio. In fact, probably the first tool you should buy. Depending on the depth of throat, the jeweler's handsaw will cost you between $10 and $20 US. A 3.5 inch saw frame is my preferred depth of throat. I find I can get most jobs done with it quite nicely. Like the guillotine shear, the jeweler's handsaw will not distort the metal. But unlike a guillotine shear, it's not quick or easy. But the jeweler's handsaw can cut any shape, including interior bits, through any gauge of metal, thin or thick. We'll learn more about how to use the jeweler's handsaw later in the support tutorial, the introduction to sawing and piercing. Next is the bench shear. The bench shear has two blades, a straight lower blade and a curved upper blade, which cut in unison. But because the upper blade is curved, the blade only cuts a small section of the metal at one time making the bench shear a bit more tricky than using the guillotine shear. Pinch the start of the cut line between both blades. This allows the metal to pivot on the blade. Line the end of the cut line up with the bottom blade and pull the handle down slowly. 
Unfortunately, the bench shear will always distort the metal to some degree. Although my bench shear blade is only 8 inches long, it is possible to cut a much longer piece by shimmying the metal further down the blade and continuing the cut. Shimmy, 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 cut. And shimmy, 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 shimmy. And cut. Shimmy, 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 cut. Easy peasy. Now the back side, little bit more difficult. You gotta shimmy it through underneath of the neck. Theoretically speaking, it would be possible if you had a few helpers to cut a very large sheet of metal. Although you would also need very long arms or maybe detachable ones to reach the handle. It is possible in theory. I was able to purchase my eight inch bench shear at my local hardware store, which meant no shipping costs supporting local merchants, and since it was available locally, I waited patiently until it went on sale for a hundred dollars. Which brings us to hand snips, which I got given to me for free, even better than on sale. I do love free tools. Hand snips come in all shapes and sizes, but a pair of aviation snips, which are my preferred type of hand snip, can be picked up at your local hardware store for around $20. Like the bench shear, aviation snips are great for trimming large bits of sheet into smaller bits of sheet. Unfortunately, snips will also distort the metal. Since snips are essentially scissors for metal, it is possible to cut more complex forms than either the guillotine or bench shears, but not as detailed as the jeweler's handsaw. There are some drawbacks to using snips. Hand snips can only cut through metal as thick as your hands are strong. My hands can only manage up to one millimeter thick, and that's a bit of a struggle. If it's within your budget, I prefer a bench shear, which can cut metal up to three millimeters thick, over aviation snips, as I like the option of cutting through thicker metal. Also, snips will often leave pinch marks or serrated edges. My aviation snips leave a serrated edge about a half a millimeter wide, which will need to be factored into measurements. A half a millimeter? Really? Do I need to be that picky? Yes. A half millimeter all around the perimeter is equal to one millimeter subtracted from the overall diameter. Here's a hypothetical. Your design requires a 10 millimeter diameter disc. Too small, can't see. You're so good with the snips, you're able to cut a perfectly round, exactly 10 millimeter disc. But you fail to take into consideration the half millimeter of serrated edge, which will now need to be filed away. It does? Yes, you do not want to leave the edges of your lovely jewelry with nasty serrations. Ever. But now you've removed a half a millimeter of material all around the disc. In other words, a half a millimeter on both sides, which is equal to one millimeter in total loss of diameter. And now your 10 millimeter disc is nine millimeters in diameter. Sometimes this matters and sometimes it doesn't matter, but you need to be mindful of it. So as you can see, there are many ways to get to the same place and every road has its pluses and minuses. Since our earrings are designed to be identical flowers, it makes sense to cut the copper flower section from a billet rather than two separate sheets. A billet is simply two or more flat pieces of sheet metal adhered on top of each other, in this case, glued. When cutting multiples, gluing up a billet of multiple sheets of metal can speed things up. Why cut one earring twice when you could cut two earrings at once? You will need two pieces of flat 20 or 22 gauge copper sheet. Ideally, the metal sheet should be tight fitting and gap free. In other words, flat. It's likely you'll need to cut down a large piece of copper sheet, but if you used a guillotine shear or a jeweler's handsaw to cut your copper bits, you won't need to flatten them. Although a jeweler's handsaw is slow, cutting down your copper sheet with one will give you some very good sawing practice. Never give up the opportunity to practice a technique. You'll never get good at something if you avoid it. Sometimes spending more time with one technique can save you time in other ways. 
Using your jeweler's handsaw keeps the pieces of metal nice and flat. No need to flatten these bits of copper. They're good to go. But if you used a bench shear or a hand shear to cut your bits, you'll need to flatten them. When flattening sheet, you'll need a steel block and a soft hammer. Any soft hammer will do. Plastic, nylon, rubber, wood, or my personal favorite, a rawhide mallet. What if I don't have a steel block? Anything which is flat and hard will do the job when working with thin copper sheet. A hardwood cutting block works fine. I picked this one up at my local dollar store for one dollar. Where can I get a steel block? Your local jewelry supply store will carry them or an online jewelry supply store. But don't forget to factor in the cost of shipping. Steel blocks can be heavy. You'll get the most for your dollar at a scrap metal yard or metal store which supplies materials to the building industry. They often have cutoff bins, leftover bits which are too small for the building trade, but just right for us, and they want to get rid of them, so prices will reflect this. But don't forget to ask your friends, coworkers, and family. You never know what they have collecting dust in the garage. I have an awesome collection of odd bits, bobs, and tools donated by thoughtful people in my life, let them know what you're up to and that you're taking donations. In fact, my first steel block was given to me by a friend. And yes, I did actually get a torch given to me. Before using any steel tool, ask yourself, what can I damage? Steel is significantly harder than most metals you'll be working with, which means any nasties in the steel could be transferred to your metal. To avoid this, Place a piece of stiff cardboard on the steel block. This is an excellent way to reuse cereal boxes. I'm using the edge rather than the flat of the hammer. With small pieces of metal, this can be helpful. The edge of the hammer offers more pinpoint precision. Periodically perform a tap test. If the metal is rocking, continue fussing and farting with the metal until the metal no longer rocks during the tap test. Be sure to test both sides and check the fit. The sheets of metal should fit flat against each other without rocking or gaps. Always remember, hitting metal with too much force can send a shock wave through the metal, causing it to curl. Not what we want. How flat is flat enough? An excellent question. Thank you. The metal does not need to be perfectly flat, but only flat enough that the glue will hold. Too much gappage and the glue won't hold. There's a good chance the metal will separate before you finish your cutting. A small gap or two is workable. Experience will let you know what will work and what won't work. Now that the two pieces of metal are nice and flat, glue them together. I prefer using fast acting or instant glues. Epoxy glues work nicely, but take much longer to harden or achieve full bond strength. For some strange reason, I have problems working with instant glues, as I tend to glue myself to everything. So I like to put something between me and the glue. I find using a cone of sticky wax or a piece of tape to move the top metal sheet around helps with not gluing me to it and makes it easier to place small sheets of metal directly on top of one another. Once the glue is hardened, you're good to go. Once you've cut out your flower billets, you'll need to separate them. To separate your flower billet, you'll need some acetone and a glass jar. When working with acetone, always wear gloves, protective eyewear, and work in a well-ventilated area. Do it outside if you can. Never inhale the fumes as they can be nauseous. And don't forget to read the manufacturer's directions and warning label. Soak your flower billet in acetone for about 30 minutes. At this point, the flower label paper will come off easily, but your flowers need a bit of convincing. Use a sharp knife and gently convince the flowers to separate. Don't bend the petals. If your petals don't want to separate, back into the acetone they go. Once separate, back into the acetone they go for about 15 minutes. To remove any leftover glue poopies. 
When drilling holes in metal, you could use a handheld rotary tool or a drill press. Drill presses have six core parts, the on and off switch, the table, the motor and spindle pulleys, the chuck, the spindle, and the chuck key. Some presses will have more adjustment knobs, bits, bobs, and pieces, but all will have the core six parts. Drill presses come in all sizes and shapes. They're designed to drill holes and nothing but holes, so they're very good at it. If you need something drilled perfectly perpendicular, use a drill press. Generally, large drill presses are designed to drill large holes and small presses for small holes. It's mainly to do with RPMs, torque, and motor size, basically power. The more material being removed, the more power might be needed. Nicole, I have a rather large floor drill press for woodworking at home. Can I use that or do I need to pick up a smaller press just for jewelry work? Not necessarily. It really depends on how well your drill press chuck is centered. If your spindle and chuck are centered, the drill bit will run nice and evenly with no wobbles. This is called running true. But if the chuck and spindle are not perfectly centered, the drill bit will have a wobble in it and it will never run true. This can be a big problem when using small drill bits. And why is that? A wobbly drill bit will always drill a larger hole than the actual size of the drill bit. And small drill bits are more likely to break if it's wobbling. If you have a drill press already, or if you add one to your studio, be sure to check if it has a wobble. How? Before operating any rotary tool, always remove any loose jewelry or clothing, tie your hair back, and wear protective eyewear. Checking for a wobble is as simple as inserting a small drill bit and observing the rotation. If it wobbles, you've got a wobble. What size? How? I'd use a one millimeter drill bit, and this is how you do it. A drill press chuck can be opened and closed quickly by hand. Close the chuck all the way, then slowly open it until the drill bit will slide in. Tighten the chuck first by hand, then with a the key. Turn the drill press on, big wobble. Try again, nice and true. My drill bit is very wobbly, not because my drill press chuck has a wobble in it, but because I did not center the drill bit in the chuck properly. I know this because I know my drill press and it runs true. It's very easy to off-center a drill bit, so keep an eye on that. If you know your press runs true, and you've double-checked to be sure the drill bit is centered in the chuck, but there's still a wobble. You've got a bent drill bit. Don't use it. Throw it away, but not into a garbage bin. Always dispose of sharp safely in a plastic container with a screw-top lid. I use an old ammonia bottle. It's where all of my broken saw blades, used scalpels, bent or broken drill bits end up. And don't forget to label it. Before you drill, you'll need to make a center punch. A center punch is a small divot in the metal which will catch the drill bit, so it doesn't skitter around on the metal, making a mess. You'll need a steel block, a soft hammer, and a center punching tool. Remember, you're not trying to go through the metal with the center punch. That's what drill bits are for. You should not see any big bumps on the back side. You just need to hit hard enough to create a divot which the drill bit can snug into without putting any bumps on the back side. Always drill into a piece of wood. Slowly bring the handle down and line up the drill bit with the center punch. Turn the drill press on and slowly bring the handle down. And there you go. A nice one millimeter hole. Alternatively, you could use a handheld rotary tool to drill your holes with, such as a flexible shaft, which you can purchase at your local jewelry supply store or maybe your local hardware store for around $300 US. But there are also economy versions, which will cost as low as $100. But a Dremel-like handheld rotary tool from your local hardware store could cost as low as $20. Look for sales. I have a Fordham, which is a high-end flexible shaft. At $300, it's a bit pricey, but I've had mine for 25 years, 
and it's still working just as well as when I first purchased it. A flexible shaft will come with a retractable cullet requiring a chuck key and a foot pedal for power control. Use the key to close the cullet all the way. Slowly open the cullet until you can slide the drill bit in. Tighten with the key. Wobble. It's really easy to off-center a drill bit. Wobble. Try again. Running true. Always drill into a bit of scrap wood. A little bit of wax will help with a smoother cut. Do not try to drill with your hand floating above the wood. Brace your hand against the wood. This will help stabilize your hand. Snug the drill bit into the center punch. Start the drill slowly and push down. And there you have it, a nice drilled hole. A handheld Dremel-like rotary tool will come with a selection of cullets and an on and off switch with a few power settings to choose from. Because the cullets are a specific size, regular drill bits will not work. You'll need to get a drill bit with a tapered mandrel. Find the cullet which fits your drill bit and tighten the cullet. Turn your motor on to a medium speed. As with the Fordham, stabilize your hand on the wood. Snug the drill bit into the center punch and push down. And there you have it, a nice hole. Regardless of what tool you use to drill your holes, always read the manufacturer's instructions. They're full of tips and tricks, not to mention safety information. Oh yeah, don't forget to deburr the backside. Sawing and piercing is one of my favorite jewelry making techniques. I like to think of it as drawing in metal. It's a great way to work with imagery. You will need a V-board, a jeweler's handsaw, some way to make a hole, some files, and a bit of emery. A what board? A V-board is where all the action happens. Where can I get a V-board? V-boards can be purchased at your local jewelry supply shop or online. But I prefer to make my own out of a bit of 1x4 hardwood. Mine is cherry, but really it could be any wood. Pine, spruce, MDF, as long as it's smooth. A V-board can be secured to your workspace with bolts or a clamp. Let's say I want to cut this out. Normally, I would use a piece of copper about this big, but I'm going to use a larger piece of copper than I need so my fingers aren't in the way of your view. How did you get the image on the copper? Good question. Draw or print your image onto label paper. Alternatively, you could glue your image onto the copper. A center punch is a little divot which gives the drill bit something to snug into. Otherwise, it may skitter around the metal, making a mess. Use a steel block, center punch, and a hammer. Any hammer will do. Remember, you're not trying to go through the metal with the center punch. That's what drill bits are for. You should not see any big bumps on the back side. You just need to hit hard enough to create a divot which the drill bit can snug into without putting any bumps on the back side. And drill a hole. I know I always say to drill into a bit of scrap wood, but you can also drill over the V opening. You just don't want to make holes all over your V board. To learn more about drilling holes, please view. Sometimes drilling will cause a burr on the back side. Remove the burr with a bit of 220 emery. Burrs are rough and like to snag on the V-board, which can make it difficult to cut a smooth line. The jeweler's handsaw is one of the most important tools in your kit, so it's important to learn not only how to use it, but how to maintain and care for it. The jeweler's handsaw consists of the handle, the throat, and three nuts. Depending on the depth of throat, the jeweler's handsaw will cost between $10 and $20 US and can be purchased at your local jewelry supply shop or online. Which size do you recommend?
A three and a half inch saw frame is my preferred depth of throat. I find it gets most jobs done quite nicely. A brand new hand saw will come collapsed and covered in grease. Wipe the grease off with a dry cloth. Do not wash it, it will rust. First, open up the saw. How much? It really doesn't matter. We'll be adjusting it to the correct size in a bit. But for now, this much will do. Rest the top of the saw frame against your bench and rest the handle against your body. This way you'll have both hands free. Insert the saw blade into the top nut first, all the way until you hit the stopper. The saw blade only has teeth on one side. If this is the top and this is the bottom, the teeth of the saw blade should be facing out and pointing down towards the bottom or the handle. Carefully run your finger up the blade. You should feel the prick of the saw blade teeth going up and no prick of the saw blade teeth going down. Always feel your prick up. Next, adjust the height of your saw frame. I like to have it about so. Unlike the top nut, you do not want the saw blade all the way into the bottom nut. This will make sense in a bit. Before securing the bottom, check to make sure the blade is parallel to the saw frame. If not, adjust it. Push the saw frame against the table. This will cause the saw frame to bend in and the saw blade to move deeper into the bottom nut. Hold the saw frame in this position and tighten the bottom nut. This will set the saw blade tension. Without tension on the saw blade, the blade will wiggle about and you will not be able to control the cut. Also, you'll break a lot of saw blades. Give your blade a ping. Lovely sound. If you find you're having problems controlling the cut, check your saw blade tension. If the tension is good, you could have a bent saw blade. Even a brand new, just out of the package saw blade could be bent. It really doesn't take much to bend a saw blade. A little wax on the back side of the saw blade helps lubricate the blade and make for a smoother cut. What kind of wax? I prefer beeswax or sculpting wax with beeswax in it, as it's sticky and stays on the blade longer. But any wax will do, even the butt end of an old votive candle. Why on the back side of the blade? You could apply wax to the front of the saw blade, but be mindful that more is not better. It's really easy to clog up the teeth with wax. Then you have no teeth. I put wax on the back side of the blade as I find it less likely to clog up the teeth. There really isn't much to handsaw maintenance. You just need to keep your nuts clean. Every once in a while, remove your nuts. Broken saw blade bits, metal dust, and wax can accumulate under your nuts. Every once in a while, give them a wipe with your fingers, or a dry cloth if you prefer. If you find the saw blade keeps slipping out of your nuts, give them a clean. Saw blades come in different sizes. They will all come in the same length, but will be different in how many or how large the teeth are. I like to think of it as a scale. The further you go this way, the coarser or bigger the teeth are, and the further you go this way, the finer or the smaller the teeth are. On this side of the scale, you have whole numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Eight being the coarsest. And on this side of the scale, you have ought sizes. One o, two o, three o, four o, five o, six o, seven o, and eight o. Eight o being the finest. It's a rare occasion when I use a whole number saw blade as I find them too coarse. They tend to bind in the metal and remove too much material. What size saw blade should I use? I recommend beginners start with a 3.0. You can purchase your saw blades from your local jewelry supply store or online. By the single dozen or by the gross, which is a dozen dozen. 144 blades? That's a lot of blades. Do I need that many blades? No. To start, a dozen should do you just fine. Although everyone is different, you may break a few blades or a lot of blades. Experience will let you know how many you need. But with practice, you'll break fewer and fewer blades. 
always dispose of sharps safely in a plastic container with a screw top lid. I use an old ammonia bottle. It's where all my broken saw blades, used scalpels, bent or broken drill bits end up. And don't forget to label it. I usually cut out the interior bits first while I have something big to hold on to, then the exterior bits. Thread the saw blade through the hole, push the metal all the way up the saw frame and tilt the handle up. Otherwise, the weight of the metal will make it difficult to get a tight blade. Straddle the metal with your fingers. This will make it easier to hold the metal against the V-board and to move it around. Let the saw do the job. It's the sharpness of the blade, not your force, which cuts through the metal. I often cut directly on the cut line, but I would recommend beginners to cut slightly inside the line. Always give yourself a little bit of mucking up room. As long as you're on the correct side of your cut line, files and emery can be used to crisp up your sawing. Go slowly. This is not a race. Your goal is accuracy, not speed. Be sure to hold the saw frame straight up and down, not at an angle. It's quite possible to cut the top and bottom of the metal differently, so be mindful of this. Brush away any metal dust with a paintbrush. If you can't see the line, you can't follow the line. As I come into my point, I'll need to do a pivot. Pivot? Apply a bit of wax to the back side of the blade. Move the blade up and down. Although my saw is moving up and down, because I'm not applying any forward pressure to the saw frame, the saw is not cutting forward. Slowly turn the metal. Once in the cut, pull the blade towards yourself. As there are no teeth on the back side of the saw blade, it can be used to pivot on. If you turn the metal too fast, the blade will break. As my teacher used to say, if you're not breaking blades, you're not working. But with practice, you'll break fewer and fewer blades. At my second point, rather than pivoting, I'm going to take the points out in chunks. Why? A pivot is in essence using your saw blade like a drill bit so it will leave a small round hole. But for this point, I want a tight corner. Saw down to the end of the point. Then carefully back the saw blade out just a bit. Cut across. And pivot onto the cut line. As you come to the end of the cut, slide over and cut into the wood. This will stabilize your blade, slow down the cut, and help prevent cross-cutting. To restart your cut, push your blade firmly against the existing cut line. This will help stabilize your blade. Slowly bring the blade down and continue cutting. As I finish cutting out my heart, just for a split second, nothing will be holding my blade, causing me to punch forward. Now I've nicked my heart. I could have avoided this by sliding over and cutting into the V-board. Something to keep in mind for next time. Chances are you're going to have to do some filing and or emmering. Depending on how good or not so good your sawing is, you may need to spend a small amount of time or a not so small amount of time cleaning up the cut. This is where you'll notice the benefit of sawing slowly and accurately. Generally, files are coarse and emeries are fine. So use files if you have a fair amount of metal to remove and emeries when you have a small amount of metal to remove or to smooth and remove file marks. When it comes to choosing the right file, basically use a file which best matches the shape you are filing. This part of my heart is curved, so I'm going to use a half round file. A half round file has one side which is curved and one which is flat. The curved side of my file will help shape out the curve in my heart and get rid of my nick. 
whereas the flat side will work nicely for the straighter sections. It can be helpful to flip and file. This way you can see the full shape as it is without the paper design as a distraction. Always be mindful of how you're holding the file. Straight up and down, not tilted. You don't want to bevel your edges. Unless, of course, you do want to bevel your edges. I don't, so I'm being mindful to hold the file straight up and down. Files will leave file marks. We don't like file marks. We don't? No, we don't. Emery will remove file marks. We like emery. Start with 220 grit. You can use loose emery strips or emery strips with a handsaw. Apply a bit of tape to the back side of a bit of emery, trim, and cut. And there you have it, a lovely emery strip. Emery strips can also be used with a hand saw. The process of attaching an emery strip to the saw frame is the same as a saw blade. My strip is 14 centimeters long and 1 centimeter wide. Insert the emery strip until it touches the screw threads of the top nut of the saw frame. Tighten the nut and be sure the strip is parallel to the back side of the saw frame. If not, fuss with it until it is. Adjust the length of the saw frame until the emery strip just touches the top of the bottom nut. Insert the emery strip and give the saw frame a push against the table. The strip should be nice and tight. Sawing out the outside is pretty much the same as sawing out the inside, but no hole required. A tight curve is very much like a pivot point. You need to control the forward movement. With a pivot, you don't want the saw blade moving forward at all. But with a tight curve, you want the saw blade to move forward very slowly. So just a tiny bit of forward pressure on the saw frame. If you apply too much forward pressure, you'll have a hard time making the curve tight. Most beginners apply too much force to the saw frame. The saw blade can only remove so much material at a time. So trying to force the blade through the metal is not really going to work. It's the sharpness of the saw blade which cuts through the metal, not your force against the saw frame. Putting too much forward pressure on the saw frame will result in a poor cut and broken saw blades. Breathe deeply, relax. Always let the saw blade do the work. This is not a race. Remember, you're after accuracy, not speed. Once you have developed some mad sawing skills, speed will come all on its own. There are also several exterior pivot points, which are pretty much the same as interior pivot points. Always apply a bit of wax to the back side of the blade before starting a pivot. Turn the metal slowly, and remember, no forward pressure on the saw frame. You want to keep it stationary. There are also a couple partial pivot points, so no forward pressure and turn the metal slowly. As long as you're on the correct side of the cut line, a bit of filing and emmering can clean up any bad cut. My favorite half round file will fit nicely in these curves, whereas the other side, the flat side, can do the rest. Don't forget to keep an eye on the tilties. But since I was slow and accurate with my sawing, not to mention I've been doing this for 25 years, quite honestly, I don't need to do any filing and can go straight to 220 emery. As it happens, my file handle is just the right size. 
that if I wrap a bit of 220 emery around it and secure it with a bit of tape, I'd have a most excellent emery tool. A bit of emery on a bit of dowel, secured with a bit of tape, will smooth out this curve. And the ever handy emery pad. We'll make short work of this straight bit. Don't forget the points. We don't like sharp, pointy jewelry. Now that you know how to saw and pierce, it's time to saw out some flowers.